Thank you very much. Happy Friday. It is my privilege to introduce to you John Sego uh, with Texas Right to Life. Uh, first of all, John is a husband to his wife, Brandy, and a father to two children, Nahum, age six, and Sophia, age four. And uh, those are pretty great accomplishments in life right there, aren't they? You could just stop right there. You know, uh, John is the legislative director for Texas Right to Life and has been involved in numerous battles in Austin, uh, one of them being House Bill 2 back in 2013, which was the one that, you remember, banned abortion uh, after 20 weeks, uh, in most cases, uh, due to fetal pain. And he was, he was very much involved in that. But you know, the way I want to talk about John uh, is this, is that when, when you're dealing with the issue of abortion, there are smart people that will come to you with tough questions and say, well, Representative Schaefer, have you thought about this scenario? Have you thought about this scenario and that scenario? The ones that are not just cut and dried and, and you're quick with an answer. And so you wonder, who's the smartest guy you can find who thinks about these things and has studied these things, has a double major in philosophy and biblical studies, and is working on his master's in bioethics from Trinity International University in Chicago. You call John Siga, and when it comes to the tough questions, the tough ethical and moral questions, and somebody who really is a subject matter expert on the taking of lives inside the womb. You call John Seiko, and he's going to come over and he's going to talk these things through with you. Uh, and he's got the answers. And I am so thankful for that. I know my staff relies upon him. Have you been in my office this week, John? Yep. Uh, and uh, he's in the Capitol helping us on, on legislation. And so you need people who get up in the morning thinking about how do we stop the Holocaust that is happening in the United States and really around the world? And that's how I describe it. I am thankful that there are people who have dedicated their lives and their professional energy to this cause. Because where would we be without them? We're, we're laymen compared to, uh, to John. And we really, uh, I don't know if you do support Texas Right to Life and their efforts, but uh, get on their email list, get on their website. There is no other organization in the state of Texas that is bigger, that is tougher, that is more persistent, who doesn't quit and it doesn't compromise than Texas Right to Life. And I've been around the other organizations. I've been in the back hall meetings with representatives from other so-called pro-life organizations and watch their representatives um, just be very quick to offer up compromises when, when victory is at hand and you just don't understand why they do it. But that's not Texas right to life. They're ready to go to war. They're ready to do what it takes to win the fight and they don't go away. They don't go away. They're there every time we show up and I look forward to working with them again when the session starts in January. We're already working with these guys. So John, why don't you come on up? When uh, Joanne told me that Representative Schaefer was gonna be doing my intro, I said, why doesn't he just give my speech? He's, <laughs> he's, he's a great representative. You guys are blessed to, to have him here. Um, I could do all the research, all the drafting, uh, and, uh, and get everything perfect, what the perfect law would be, the perfect arguments to make on the floor, but I've gotta have an elected official to make those. I've gotta have an elected official to actually be on the House floor to offer the hard amendment, to bring up the hard arguments and answer uh, the anti-life forces, and uh, Repres Representative Schaefer is one of, the, uh, one of the strongest voices we have uh, in the House. So uh, very blessed to have him and uh, give my introduction, so thank you. Representative, look forward to continuing the fight uh, in uh, just a few weeks. So again, uh, my name is John Sego. I serve as the Legislative Director for Texas Rights to Life. Uh, I've worked with the organization for 12 years, 
and uh, I know a lot of you are looking at me and think I'm hardly 12 years old in the first place. Uh, but uh, I've been working for Right to Life for, for 12 years, and uh, Texas Right to Life did not violate any child labor laws when they hired me. Uh, everything was legal. You, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I am blessed for this to be uh, my job. I have a lot of other roles, a lot of other jobs um, that I do on the side, but this is my, my full-time job, and it is a blessing to be able to work in this movement with individuals like you, Representative Schaefer. So one thing that Joanne asked me to talk about is priorities. That's a very important question, is what are the priorities? We all could list hundreds of things that we want to see the government do, one of the things that we want to see the Texas legislature do, but what we have in Austin is a rat race. Starting in January, when the legislative process kicks off, there is this rat race behind me. You can see to get a bill from filing all the way to the middle there to the governor's desk. We have a conservative system uh, that is built to kill legislation. All of the great ideas that politicians come up with, it's easier to kill those great ideas than it is to get them to the governor's desk. And that is a good, that is a good rule, that's a good principle to shape our government around. However, when they're in the position like me or Representative Schaefer and want to pass some good legislation, it's very difficult. So the issue of priorities is important because the legislature is not going to pass all 30 to 40 pro-life bills that are filed. Every session, something uh, you know, around 40 bills will be filed that relate to the pro-life issue. And they're not all going to pass. They don't all have an equal chance. We'll get three solid pro-life bills if we're lucky. Most sessions we get one. We get one good pro-life bill. So this question of priorities is important. There's a lot of pro-life bills uh, uh, that are gonna be filed that don't necessarily uh, rise to the level of priority. Now, before uh, we do this, uh, Text Direct to Life works on the research, we work on the brainstorming and the drafting of legislation before we even get to that first step of filing. So that's what we've been doing for the last two years. Uh, for the last two years, we've been working on, uh, even during the middle of the session, whenever representatives of last session, when representatives would have good ideas or ask us questions, we would start forming what we want to do this time. And so we do these ideas, these drafting, and um, whenever we're doing that, we ask two main questions. We ask first, where is innocent human life being threatened in our state? And second, what makes a pro-life bill a priority? Now on that first one, there are three categories of individuals that we focus on. We focus on pregnant women, we focus on preborn children, and we focus on vulnerable patients. And I'll talk about those vulnerable patients in a second, but thinking about pregnant women and preborn children, how do we figure out what a priority bill is? There's gonna be a lot of legislation that is meant to help children, is meant to help pregnant women, but how do we know? Texas Right to Life has a system Texas Rights Life has three criteria that we use to determine what type of bill on related to abortion should be a priority. And this is something that is unique about Texas Rights to Life, is that other pro-life organizations will just support whatever legislation their favorite uh, politician files, or whatever legislation uh, a, a powerful elected official uh, is talking about, and they'll just jump on that train. Our organization doesn't do that. We first look objectively at what needs to be a priority, and this is what we look at. We look at, first of all, at the top, does that bill directly save lives? There is a lot of pro-life bills that sound good, that maybe even say and claim to the rest of the state that we're pro-life, but it doesn't save a single life. There's some of those have already been filed for this upcoming session. We also have to look at whether a specific bill moves the cultural conversation forward, whether it moves the cultural conversation in the right direction. As you know, as soon as a pro-life bill gets filed and is talked about, what happens? Well, you, you post up a link to that on Facebook, or you put it on Twitter, uh, or there's a news article about it, and what happens? Immediately, there are comments on that article attacking. There's a cultural conversation that happens immediately and this has already happened with a bill that Representative Schaefer's filed, is that there's a conversation around all of these bills. So as a movement, as the pro-life movement, we feel the responsibility to make sure we're filing legislation that moves that conversation in the right direction. 
that we're actually making the conversation uh, and helping our individuals who may not agree with us on abortion, making them ask the tough questions and consider uh, some of our strongest arguments. And the last one is whether a bill leads to final legal and judicial victories. That's extremely important because as you know, the pro-life movement, we are actually working in the shadow of Roe v. Wade. We can't ignore that. We can't go to Austin and act as if the Supreme Court has not said anything on abortion. We don't like what they said. I don't think it was constitutional. I didn't think they had the, the legal grounding to say what they said. But given the paradigms that we have now, we have to prudently engage. We have to challenge the Supreme Court very strategically to get them to reverse what they said in 1973. So let's just look at this. For example, uh, what if there was a piece of legislation that said we will allow pregnant women to use an HOV lane or a carpool lane? So you know when you get into Dallas, there is in a big freeway, there's always traffic, you're always backed up in traffic, and there's one lane on the side of the freeway reserved for carpools. For eight, it's called the high occupancy vehicles, okay? So we say if you have two people in the car, you can use that lane. Well, what if we had a bill that said we'll also let pregnant women use that lane? Now that's a pro-life idea. That's a pro-life bill, right? So it comes from a place of, okay, realizing there's actually two people in that car, the pregnant woman and her preborn child. So she, that's a carpool. That's two people in the car, right? Now that's, that's a pro-life idea. I'm not going to say that's not pro-life. We're recognizing the humanity of the child. But does this save any lives? Now some of you might have had the un, uh, unfortunate situation of sitting in Dallas traffic, and you might think, well, you know, that would save some lives. Maybe a pregnant woman would want to... Uh, wants to use that lane instead of sitting in traffic. I doubt it. I doubt that a pregnant woman facing an unexpected pregnancy would say, should I have this abortion? You know what? I think I'm going to continue in the pregnancy so I can use that carpool lane. I doubt that she's going to think like that. So that bill might not save drugs. Now, I just came from Dallas. Don't get me wrong. The traffic is terrible. Um, does it move the cultural conversation in the right direction? Well, yeah. You get to say there are two people there remem reminding our audience reminding our Facebook friends and Twitter and the media that there are two individuals in that car. The preborn child has humanity. The conversation doesn't really go further than that, but it's a good it's a good opportunity to reinstate that truth. And then the last one is a allowing pregnant women in the uh, carpool lane. Is that going to overturn Roe v. Wade? No, it's not a serious enough bill. It doesn't have uh, criminal penalties. It's not enough to actually challenge the thinking and the logic of Roe v. Wade. Pro-life bill, it's not gonna be one of our priorities. It's not gonna be something that we rally the grassroots to go talk to your, your uh, representative and senator about making sure we pass this legislation, that this is our one pro-life bill. Good bill, not a priority. Another one might be to raise the penalty on pregnant women who ingest illegal substances. So it is a real problem pregnant women taking, uh, taking drugs, that affects not just her health, but it affects the health of her reborn child. We see that some children are born addicted to drugs and they have to immediately after birth have to go into therapy to actually be weaned off of illegal substances because of decisions of their mother. It's a terrible situation. Well, some representatives have said we need to raise the penalty on pregnant women that take drugs that do these illegal activities that affects the child. Okay? It's a pro-life bill. We care about the woman's health and the pre-born child's health. Is it gonna save lives? Well, we've seen the effectiveness of raising penalties, uh, the ineffectiveness of raising penalties in drug use. We see in other situations of public policy, when you raise a penalty on an illegal substance, the use does not go down. And when you have addictive behavior, that's not an effective way to treat that. It is effective to have more counseling, more services available to these individuals, that would be more effective. Another thing, what does that do to the cultural conversation? Well, that gives the media their headline because then they get to say that pro-lifers literally want to lock up pregnant women. And that's what they say about us anyway. So with that bill, it would be imprudent for us to stumble into their talking points to file a bill where they get to lead the cultural conversation. And then that, again, that doesn't lead to overturning Roe v. Wade. 
So this is uh, the, the criteria. This is a tough criteria that we use to make sure every bill we support is going to live up to these, uh, to these standards. One bill that we think does lead up to these standards is something that's gonna be a priority for us in this upcoming legislative session. Um, and it's built on this, this last point, sorry, this, this last leading to final legal and judicial victories. That is extremely important. That is something that a lot of pro-life organizations, even national pro-life organizations, don't think about. We have to look at our goal of overturning Roe v. Wade we have to stop this injustice of elective abortion by challenging what the Supreme Court has said. Now, we can't just say we disagree with Roe v. Wade. We have to prudently present arguments. We have to prudently push the line, undermine the logic that the Supreme Court has used to get there. In 1973, the Roe v. Wade, uh, Justice Blackmun wrote this. He said, if the state is interested in protecting fetal life after viability, it may go so far as to prescribe abortion during that period, viability, except when it's necessary to preserve the life or health of the mother. This was the beginning of a crack that we are now pushing on. This was the beginning of a crack in the foundation of Roe v. Wade that ever since has begun to get bigger and bigger. You know how a crack in your foundation works. If you ignore it, years later, it's just getting bigger. You're gonna have big problems. And that's what we're hoping with Roe v. Wade. As we keep putting the pressure on this crack, because what he's saying here is that legislate that states do have an interest in fetal life. It's not just women's health. It's not just the safety of women or reproductive justice. It is fetal life, that states do have an interest in protecting fetal life. Now here, Justice Blackmun was saying it has to be after viability, after 28 weeks. Now since then, the Supreme Court has said, okay, even before 28 weeks, even before viability, you can pass laws that are built on the state interest in protecting fetal life. So what we have, when we pass legislation, pro-lifers, we have two options. We can pass legislation that's meant for the life or health of the mother, or we could pass legislation that is to build on our state interest in fetal life. And that's very important because the other side ignores that second road. The pro-abortion forces act as if every piece of pro-life legislation has to only be for the safety of the mother. That is not true at all. The Supreme Court has said we can pass bills that are meant solely to protect pre-born children. They do not want to admit this. Our opponents, Planned Parenthood uh, and uh, NARAL, will never uh, acknowledge this. Because as soon as you start thinking about that, that states have an interest in our progeny, we have a state interest in pre-born children, the game's over. We can start passing life-saving legislation. So this has grown. And what we want to do is we want to keep moving in that direction of passing legislation that is good for women, that does protect pregnant women, but also acts on this in state interest of fetal life. And the one that we're looking at for our uh, priority, our top priority, this is our number one abortion-related priority for the upcoming legislative session. I put a page on each of your tables uh, that, that has all five of our priorities, and then I put a page that is just talking about this bill because it is the most important one uh, related to abortion. So this bill is called the Dismemberment Abortion Ban. And what this bill would do is it would prohibit one specific abortion procedure. Okay, there are several ways that abortionists take the life of a preborn child. It's a violent act, however it happens. It's inhumane, it's a stronger party preying on a weaker, smaller party. It is, it is unjust, it is an act of injustice in our land. But, strategically, we are pulling out one procedure. There are several. We're talking about one, the dismemberment abortion. This is a type of a DNA abortion, sometimes they call it. This is a type of abortion that takes the life of a preborn child by removing its limbs. The child is still alive when it is dismembered in the womb. Now I know we're, most of us in here are pro-life, and this is even hard for us to hear. But we're getting to a point in the cultural conversation where we have to speak the truth. We have to be honest. 
And the truth is, abortion is violent. It's not a health service. It's not, uh, it's not justice, reproductive justice. It's a violent act. It's taking a life by removing its limbs. Now, we're not going to be graphic. We're not going to be gory. We're not going to scare people into this. We're going to tell them the truth, though. We're going to speak the truth, and that's what we have to do. So this bill will prohibit that one specific type of abortion. So, so uh, Representative Schaefer mentioned that in 2013, we passed a bill that said no abortions after 20 weeks because that's when preborn children can feel pain. It's, there's a consensus that they feel pain at 20 weeks. Uh, so we're not just going down again. So it's not just we passed the 20 week and now we're gonna pass the 19 week and then in two years we'll pass the 18 week. That's not the strategy. The strategy is to present the Supreme Court with new arguments, with new angles to look at this issue. And then this new angle is very similar to what happened in 2007. This angle is to focus on one type of procedure. So it's not limited to an age or time in the pregnancy. Now, in 2007, Justice Kennedy saw how gruesome this activity was. And in 2007, he, 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 uh, did the, he said this quote here, that that child dies just like you and I would. So it's this humanity of the child. Even Justice Kennedy, the swing vote on the Supreme Court, the individual who ruled against us last year, whenever we had a case before him. He's not a, a, part, a pro-lifer, but he realized how graphic or how uh, violent and inhumane elective abortion is. And, and this is important because what he said in 2007 is that states could prohibit specific procedures if they were torturous and inhumane. So what we did is we took what he said, we looked at his criteria, and we went around and we said, well, what else is torturous and inhumane? And we found an example for you, Justice Kennedy. Now, the, the point is to show him that's an arbitrary line, that all abortions are violent. All abortions are life-taking taking activities. But what we have to do is strategically start undermining these logics, because the Supreme Court keeps drawing lines. They drew a line of viability uh, before viability and after one, uh, but before viability and after viability. That's an artificial line. That line is moved by scientific means. Uh, it, it doesn't, there's no magical moment at 28 weeks where the child all of a sudden changes into a human being that we would recognize. So, so they're drawing these arbitrary lines and what we have to do as the pro-life movement is keep showing them that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. There's no real ethical distinction. And so that's what we're doing here is we're saying this abortion procedure is done late in a pregnancy and early in a pregnancy. So this late, you know, the Supreme Court has kind of indicated that early abortions are ethical and later abortions are a little less ethical. We gotta stop that. That's not true. Elective abortion is a violent activity that takes the life of a human, uh, of a human individual. All abortions. And, and, and so, but this, this strategy is to focus on one that cuts through some of the logic. And that's the dismemberment abortion ban. And looking back at what we said, so, so it will directly save lives. About 5,000 of these uh, DNEs happen every year. Um, and uh, so that, you know, that type of abortion, that dismemberment, that category of dismemberment fits into. So we have 5,000 of these happening that we want to stop. Uh, it will save those lives. We see that this will move the cultural conversation in the right direction because we're actually talking about the humanity of the child and the inhumanity of elective abortion. That's what I want my pro-choice neighbors in Austin to have to deal with. I want that to be the conversation when they say, why am I pushing this crazy bill? I want them to, I want to have to, I want to get to tell them about the inhumanity of elective abortion. And this bill will help start that conversation. And finally, like we just talked about, this will help us get the next step to overturn Roe v. Wade. There's about three steps. Uh, so, so Texas Right to Life, we're working with uh, other state groups, we're working with national groups to see how are we gonna do this. We don't just say we wanna overturn Roe v. Wade, Lord willing, however it happens. We know that in God's sovereignty that will happen, but we also have a responsibility to be smart about it, to be prudent. And so we have, there's, we've kind of located about three different steps that we have to get, three different types of cases that have to go before the Supreme Court before we can challenge Roe v. Wade head on. And this is one of them, to challenge that viability line. Um, and uh, so, so we kind of, working through this, leading to final legal and judicial victories. 
There are a couple of other issues that I want to mention here, and if you have questions about these, we can maybe give them a little bit more detail uh, in the Q&A session uh, in, in a second. Um, but first of all is uh, pro-life insurance reform. Um, with Under the Affordable Care Act, uh, we have the ability as a state to opt out of paying for abortion coverage. So right now, if I go get a healthcare plan on healthcare.gov uh, or at a uh, insurance by insurance agent, if I go get healthcare for you know, coverage for me and my family, um, my plan that I adopt in Texas may be paying for the premium, it may be paying for the abortion coverage of someone else in that same plan. Whereas the federal government has said states can opt out, and about 35 of them have, but you know who hasn't? Texas. We haven't opted out. We haven't passed that legislation because of political games in Austin. We haven't even done this, and this is, you know, Obama said we could do this. Obama said if pro-life states want to do this, go ahead. We're not even, a, a, you know, we're just taking him up on his offer. We haven't done that yet. That's it's a really missed opportunity so far. Um, so pro-life insurance reform. Uh, this uh, next one is the uh, Prenatal Non-Discrimination Act. Um, this is a bill that Representative Schaefer has been leading on and helping us with. This is uh, making sure that we're, we're kind of making up for a loophole that moderate Republicans have demanded in Austin. So in 2013, we said that we weren't, gonna we weren't going to allow abortions after 20 weeks. So no abortions after 20 weeks in Texas, except for babies that may have a disability for babies that might have an abnormality. For those children, we'll let them be aborted after 20 weeks. That is egregious. That is indefensible. Usually in society, we say that if there's someone who's disabled, there's someone who has an abnormality, has a defect, we actually give them more attention. We actually give them more services, more protections. This is the complete opposite. We said we'll, we'll protect babies as long as they're healthy. There is no defense for that. That's why we're pro-life in the first place, because pre-born children are the most defenseless in our society. They're the ones that don't have a voice to stand up for themselves. And here, what we said in 2013, because of moderate Republicans demanded this exception, we said, okay, but if the baby might, you know, if it's suspected that the baby has an abnormality, we'll allow them to be born. There's no excuse for that. And thankfully, Representative Schaefer has been leading the way on, on closing that loophole. And in this bill, we're also applying some protections, saying you can't abort a baby just because they're disabled, even before 20 weeks. And you can't abort a baby just because you found out it was a girl. This, uh, you know, these gets, uh, is talked about from India and China, these sex-selective abortions. They also happen in Texas. Um, abortion clinics talk about this all the time. So, so what we have here is non-discrimination. We're going to say that would be a discriminatory abortion if a woman is going to have um, to take the life of this innocent child because it's uh, because of its gender, because of its race, because of a disability. And also, this has some uh, ways to get more services to these families that might have a disability if their child really is going to, uh, you know, has a, an abnormality. Uh, we want to make sure that they have access to the social services, the counseling and the medical services like perinatal hospice to help these families through this hard time. Um, I've had several friends that have, uh, that have had uh, various situations or prospective situations like this, uh, and they needed help. And as a state, there's a lot we can do for these families. Uh, and so that number two is a, is a bill that's close to our hearts that we're gonna fight hard for. Uh, and then we have the abortion coercion prevention. We, see, we hear story after story of women in Texas who were forced to undergo an abortion, who did not want to have an elective abortion, but their husband, their boyfriend, parents, uh, there's even a story out of Corpus Christi about a volleyball coach forcing a student who he had an affair with to have an abortion. These are forced abortions. Well, the other side says it's her body, her choice. It should be up to the woman. They're pro-choice, right? Well, wouldn't you be surprised they don't support this bill? Wouldn't you be surprised that they don't want to add protections for women that would like to resist that pressure to have an abortion? Odd, right, huh? So, so that's one that we're, we'll definitely be working on. And this last one is alternatives to abortion funding. A lot of times the pro-life movement is seen as the no movement. No, we don't want you to do that. No, we don't want you to have this. No, we don't want you to, to have that procedure. Uh, this is another way that we're saying yes 
we want to give these services to women. So we have a network in Texas called the uh, Texas Pregnancy Care Network of social services that come in and help women um, who are have an unexpected pregnancy or uh, are new parents and need some social services, need some assistance. And uh, there's some great uh, pregnancy centers, adoption agencies, maternity homes, and social services offices in this network that help those women. You have some here in Tyler that are involved in this program and they get some government reimbursement for the ministry that they have to women who are in these situations. And so that's a way that we as a pro-life movement can say yes, we wanna come alongside those pregnant women and new parents and help them uh, uh, for choosing life and after they chose life. So those are some of the returning issues. Uh, and then I will add uh, two more. Let's see, I can't really see what time is. Oh, we got plenty of time. Okay, so there is one other side of the movement we talked about. So I, at the beginning, we looked at where is innocent human life being threatened. So we talked about pregnant women, we talked about um, pre-born children, and this last category that people usually don't think about is vulnerable patients. Vulnerable patients. So patients in a hospital that are being taken advantage of. Individuals in a hospital or medical uh, facility that need protection. What we're doing as a pro-life movement, and we have all of these principles that lead us to protect pre-born children and pregnant women, those same principles, what Text Right to Life is doing, uh, is applying those same principles to medical ethics, to how our doctors and hospitals treat patients. And the biggest problem that we've seen in Texas is that at the end of the day, patients and their families are not the final authority on important medical decisions. So what we have in Texas, we have a uniquely bad law called the Texas Advanced Directive Act. And this is listed on the five priority bills on the, on the, uh, the handout that I put on your table. One of the handouts has the five bills that we're gonna prioritize. Number two and number three are what we're talking about now. Number two and number three, these are areas of state law where the pro-life movement needs to uh, add protections for patients. So in Texas, we say that not all the time are patients and their families the final authorities when it comes uh, to these important medical decisions. So one example is the do not resuscitate orders. Uh, most everyone in here knows do not resuscitate order is a, a, a file that you put, in, or it's a sheet you put in your medical file if you don't want CPR or if you don't want intubation, or if you don't want the paddles, okay? This is a, a document to tell your hospital, to tell your physician what treatment you do not want, okay? Now, there are appropriate times to have a DNR. Um, there's a good discussion of when it's appropriate, when it's inappropriate. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about who decides whether you have a DNR. Now, Text Right to Life, we serve as patient advocates. We help families around the state that have conflicts with their hospitals or with their physicians. And what I've seen um, is examples where I go to the bedside to help talk to the family about a conflict they're having with the hospital. I go there and I start looking through their file and there's a DNR. And I pick it up and I ask you know, the, the wife, uh, or in this case, the mother of a young boy, I ask, I was like, when did you sign this? You know, What was your thinking behind this document? Because it doesn't seem to line up with what I'm hearing you say. And she said, what is that? I said, this is a do not resuscitate order. This means if he, be, uh, needs paddles, if he needs CPR, if he needs uh, intubation, medical attention, if he has cardiac or respiratory uh, arrest, he, you know, he won't get it. He'll pass away. And she said, well, I don't want that. I, I've never seen that document. I said, are you sure? Was it you know, in a big pile of paper? And she said, it's bright pink. I think I would notice it. So, so what you had was a DNR on a 12-year-old boy in Fort Worth that the mother had no idea who put it there. And it ends up, we confronted the doctor, and the doctor said, well, it makes sense that they would want this in this terrible situation. Well, it might make sense to him, but nobody made that decision for this 12-year-old boy. The mother definitely didn't make that decision. So that's the type of abuse that I'm talking about, is this is a life-ending decision, a very important medical decision that sometimes is appropriate, uh, but it's got to be the family and the patient making that decision. And we don't have that in Texas. Texas law is silent on how we handle do not resuscitate orders in hospitals. We have good laws about in a nursing home or at a senior facility or even at your own home if you have a DNR on your refrigerator. We have a lot of good laws about those. 
those kind of contexts, but as soon as you walk through the hospital doors, Texas law doesn't tell hospitals what to do. So hospitals are taking advantage. Now, not every hospital, there are good hospitals. I know, you know a good one around this area. There are good hospitals that are good physicians, but we've seen abuses. We've seen a lot of abuses in Texas. So that's what I'm talking about. Applying these same principles, we value every individual human life. Taking that same principle and applying it to someone in a hospital bed. Applying to someone who's trying to make life or death decisions at the clinical level. That's what I mean. The second one on there, uh, number three, on the priority list, is even worse. Because what this does, this is the Texas Advanced Directive Act. This is a process in law that allows a hospital to completely ignore your decision about life-sustaining treatment, about a ventilator or dialysis. So if you uh, have in your advanced directive, or if your husband or wife are there at the bedside saying you want a ventilator or you want dialysis, we have in Texas law, that's not the final word. That Texas hospitals and physicians can go through this legal process and at the end of it, give you 10 days and say, we disagree with you, we met about it, we invited you to the meeting to come, you know, make your case. Now you have 10 days to get to another facility or we're just cutting off the treatment. It doesn't matter that you put in your advanced directive that you wanted the ventilator. It doesn't matter that your wife, who's your medical power of attorney, was there saying to keep the ventilator on. None of that matters. Texas law says we can do this. And that's what we've seen. We've seen abuses of this. Uh, actually, we've seen just not even abuses, just them using this process. You put it in law, they're gonna use it. So this has been in law since 1999, and we've seen cases where you had somebody written in their advanced directive, they wanted the ventilator, and a hospital still used this process. And, uh, and it's, it's completely unethical. There's no, no justification for this. I can understand some of the, the conflicts that we want to avoid at the clinical level, but there are better laws, there are more ethical ways to handle this. Texas is unique in having this approach uh, of a process. And at the end of the process, you can't go to court, you can't file, you can't, uh, file a malpractice suit against that physician. There's no administrative penalties. He can't go before the Texas Medical Board. There's no criminal penalties. He didn't commit homicide, even though he ended someone's life against their will. So, so it's an egregious law. So this is what I mean by applying those same pro-life principles that make us uh, just abhor elective abortion, applying those over to medical ethics. And people don't think about that when we think about the pro-life cause, but this is a very important issue, and this is a political hot topic in Austin, as you can imagine, because my opponents in this debate are the Texas Medical Association, the Texas Hospital Association. They want the authority. They want uh, all of the ability to make medical decisions for patients and your loved ones. So this is a law that we've been trying to work on since 2004. It's politically confusing. Uh, there are pro -life, there are groups that, that claim to be pro-life that support this law, that defend this law. And, uh, and, and so it's a, a very tough political fight, but it's one that we can't give up. It's one that we can't let down. So that's why on the priority list, it's number two and number three. These are very important issues and we have to make progress in this. Texas is unique and other states are looking to Texas as a solution. Okay, looking at Texas, is this process working? Now, thankfully, other states are saying, oh no, it's not working. Oh no, it's not a fair process. It is unethical. There's not an appeals process. There's a lot of abuses in this. So thankfully, other states are not adopting our example, uh, but we are. We do have this, uh, this egregious law. So uh, let's go ahead and open it up for some questions I can expound on, on these medical ethics issues uh, or go back to some of the abortion-related topics. Um, if you have uh, a question, write it down on the card, and uh, we'll go through here, and I'll just, as you're collecting those, I'll put this up. Um, Text Right to Life, we are a nonprofit organization, so we do run off of the generosity of supporters and pro-lifers around the state. Um, you can get on our email list. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, uh, Twitter there, or just email me directly if you have any questions or comments or suggestions about legislation. Uh, you've got a pretty good representative uh, here, Representative Schaefer, so you don't have to email me asking about his record, but maybe you have uh, questions about other records of uh, elected officials around the area. Definitely, uh, definitely help you out there. We have a scorecard at TexasRightToLife.com, uh, and at the end of every session, we do rate those. Uh, we do, we do rate the votes. So you may have a busy life. You don't have time to sit there and watch every vote that they take. 
Uh, so we do the, the homework for you. We show you whether these elected officials were holding up their promise to be pro-life uh, or, or actually compromising on, on their values. And so we have that. You can find that at TexasRightToLife.com. So do we have any questions? Uh, yes. Um, first of all, thank you for the slides. I'm very visual, and I'd love a copy of the rat race one. Yeah, yeah you know, It's just very visual of how that goes. And then also the three... Um, three circles of yeah. how something is. I just thought those were really good. So if you have mm -hmm. any of those, you know, you can print those out or send them to us. Absolutely. Um, I really appreciate that because I like very visual things. So, and we may get mad in on some of this along the way, but the first question is if the dismemberment um, abortion ban is enacted in Texas, won't this unquestionably be taken to the U.S. Supreme Court? Yeah, so this is one of the arguments they had about the 20 week prohibition. So in 2013, when we passed uh, House Bill 2 it included several provisions uh, and it included this 20-week prohibition and even a pro-life organization an organization that says their goal is to end abortion in Texas they were going around the Capitol saying that 20-week prohibition was unconstitutional um, and so they were arguing against the bill that we were pushing forward with. they're doing that also with the dismemberment abortion ban already um, and so they're saying the dismemberment abortion ban is unconstitutional now, uh, if you think Roe v. Wade should be the law of the land, that's a fine argument. But Roe v. Wade itself has to be challenged. We do have to press. So, uh, so there is you know, an important argument to be had there. The, the reality is if you pass a pro-life bill and it does not get taken to court, you miss something. Our opponents, that's all they have in Texas. They can't win in elections. They can't win in Austin, in uh, the Texas legislature, they just don't have the votes. So the only chance of victory our opponents, Planned Parenthood and the others have, is in the courthouse, is finding some liberal judges, there's two specifically that they like in downtown Austin, that they take all of these pro-life bills to. So if I pass a pro-life bill, and a month goes by, two months go by, and Planned Parenthood hasn't filed a lawsuit, I go back and say, okay, what did I miss? Where's the loophole that they're okay with? I want my opponents to try every trick to stop a pro-life bill. So it does not discourage me whenever lawsuits are filed against pro-life legislation. It means that we're really getting under their skin, and they're trying to throw everything up against the wall, hoping something <coughs> sticks. So if we do pass it, yeah, I expect there to be a lawsuit. Um, the interesting thing was in in 2013, they filed legislation or they filed a lawsuit against the other parts of House Bill Two, but we saw that they said that they were not going to challenge. House bill, uh, they were not gonna challenge the 20 week prohibition because it was too dangerous in the Fifth Circuit, they said. They were worried the Fifth Circuit would have sided with us on the 20 week prohibition. So sometimes there is a little bit of that, of uh, them thinking big picture. And I think now, looking at the direction of the Supreme Court, uh, hopefully it was going, um, they may be scared into not challenging anything. Um, but uh, typically the rule is, if they don't file at least one lawsuit, you miss something. Um, what are the odds of, and I think kind of you did this, but what are the odds of the Texas legislature enacting this anytime soon? And with the House and Senate change and things, where are we looking at? Yeah, yeah, so we do, I mean, there is a conversation right now of what the priority should be. Um, so our governor, our lieutenant governor, um, and some other elected officials are talking about other pro-life bills that are important. Uh, that are good that we support, but they can't be the priority because they don't save lives. So anything in reaction to the undercover videos, remember these undercover videos of Planned Parenthood, of the abortion industry, there's a lot of bills being filed about that, about what do you do with the body after the abortion? Do we bury it? Do we cremate it? Can we allow it to be donated for scientific research? Those are, those are important questions. But if you pass all of these protections, you still had the abortion. We're still debating what to do with the body. My priority is to keep that body alive, to stop the abortion. So that's why even though I have great respect for Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and I have great respect for Governor uh, Abbott, they right now, what they're saying is the top priority we do not agree with because their legislation can pass and they'll say it's great pro-life victory, not a single life would have been saved. That's our ultimate test. So we're having these are hard conversations to have with your own friends, uh, to have with your own champions, and we're trying to have these in the Capitol. Um, and hopefully, 
during the session we'll also pass legislation that actually stops elective abortions, not just debates what we do with the body afterwards. Oh, good point. What do you think of uh, the National Pro-Life Alliance's push for the Life at Conception Act? Yeah, so this is part of that, um, on the, the three kind of, um, the, the three priorities, the three criteria that we use. That last one about whether this bill is gonna lead to legal uh, and judicial victories, that's very important. I do not think in the debate with the Supreme Court right now, we're ready for a personhood amendment, for something that would um, make all abortions illegal. So there is a good conversation about what is our strategy. I agree with the principle, absolutely. Our ultimate goal is to overturn Roe v. Wade, to stop the injustice of elective abortion, but we have to be prudent of how are we actually going to challenge the logic of Roe v. Wade. Because if we pass a bill tomorrow, or sorry, when the session starts, that just says no abortions in Texas, it won't even get to the Supreme Court. It will get struck down, and the Supreme Court won't take it up because we're not presenting anything new for them to consider whether they made it a, a mistake. So, so it's kind of a tricky thing. It's kind of playing chess. You have to present new state interests that the Supreme Court wants to engage in and look at. Uh, but it's a good conversation. I have great friends who are pushing that kind of strategy, and we have really good uh, discussions and debates. Uh, our end is the goal, you know, our, our goal is the same, uh, but we gotta talk about what our strategy is to get there. What are circumstances that, uh, what circumstances occur that justify abortions for the health and safety of the mother? Yeah, so in Texas, we have put a very strong definition in law. Um, it is there, you know, I, I do think it is ethical. Um, if the, if the woman's life, if physical life is in jeopardy, and that it is being caused, the jeopardy is being caused by the pregnancy. Now, there is only one situation that I can find, a uh, type of situation that I can find of severe ectopic pregnancies uh, that is not detected. It's a late severe ectopic pregnancy. Um, there is you know, one possible situation where uh, the abortion is needed. Now, and that's kind of getting into some details there, uh, but, but that's the only exception that we text Right to Life puts into law is because we do value the life of the mother as well. However, sometimes this debate goes, okay, life of the mother. So life and health of the mother is the exception. Saying, no, no, we need to make sure we have a tight definition that we're really addressing the, the actual medical situation that occurs uh, and uh, not just a broad anything that would be against the life and the health because uh, we've seen the Supreme Court you know, sometimes interpret legislation that the health of the mother includes mental health. So if she thinks her life would have been over socially because of this pregnancy, that would qualify, right? So, so that, that type of loophole and the things we have to think about, um, but uh, we don't, we don't uh, allow for rape and incest exceptions. Um, you know, that, that is actually uh, not protecting the preborn life. Uh, the, you know, there's two victims in that case, the mother and the child, and uh, what we would be doing if we allowed abortion in those cases is we would actually be punishing the child for a crime that neither uh, her or her mother committed. It was actually the scumbag um, that abused, that assaulted the, the woman in the first place. So um, very real, you know, very uh, hard issue, but we have to focus on our principles, even those that are very emotionally difficult situations. Scumbag is a technical term? Yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> I'm just easy. Um, there are four right to life groups in Texas. Only one is good, three are horrible. Uh, similarly, <laughs> there along with scumbags. Similarly, there are other groups in Texas. How do we know which ones of these are good? Is there a rating for um, these, for the rater? We're confused. Yeah, so yeah. Do so, those get rated? Um, <coughs> it's kind of like who fact checks the fact checkers kind of thing. Um, no, so, so what I would recommend in this is go to a representative, uh, to a senator that you know, that you trust, um, who has integrity, who uh, you believe has the character to distinguish between uh, who is actually doing good in the Capitol and ask them. Um, and thankfully you have a lot of good representatives, good senators around this area. Uh, Senator Hughes is a good friend of ours. Um, he's been in the Capitol long enough, just like Representative Schaefer, uh, to see who the bad actors are, to see who's actually you know, in the back halls undermining your values and your intentions, even though on the campaign they said these were their principles and their values. So I think that's the best way to do it, um, to ask them. And uh, I can, um, you know, there, there are reasons I, I can talk about other organizations that I like that I don't like. Um, there are a handful of organizations uh, involved in the Capitol that I trust. Uh, and uh, Joanne is one of them. She represents you very well in the Capitol. 
um, and she has a reputation for it. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the Texas Values is another good organization that we work very closely with. Texas Evil Forum is a great organization that we work with, Concerned Women of America and Texas Homeschool Association uh, and Empower Texas. Those are really the only organizations that we can trust, uh, that believe that we think are on our side uh, in this battle. And uh, so unfortunately, uh, that's a difficult question, but I would ask a representative or elected official you trust. I think we've had all of those here within the last Definitely the last yep. year, so we're there on board. Um, this kind of goes along with that. Who are the supposed pro-life groups uh, that are supporting abortion? Well, it's an opposite question. Who are the supposed pro-life groups supporting abortions? Who are, does that make? Who are the supposed pro-life groups? Yes. Yeah. So, so, abortions? Uh, so, so there are other organizations, and you can just look at their endorsements. You don't have to be uh, behind closed doors to see. Um, we see that organizations like Texas Alliance for Life, organizations like for um, Texans, uh, Texas for Life Coalition, um, and the Heidi Group, um, these are organizations that are endorsing candidates that have publicly argued against pro-life amendments on the House floor. So these are matters of public record. Um, Representative Schaefer offered a very needed, much needed, strong pro-life amendment, and an, a, a Republican who claims to be a pro-life champion got on the House floor and gave a speech against Representative Schaefer's pro-life amendment, saying, vote this amendment down, this amendment that would save lives. Then these other pro-life organizations, these three pro-life organizations, endorsed that individual who says he's pro-life, a pro-life champion. So, so these are issues of a public record. You don't have to have any insider knowledge or any secret tape, videotape about what's going on. But again, I would refer you to, uh, you know, to elected officials that you trust to kind of be able to distinguish between who's actually working for you and who's working against you. We're gonna ask a few more. I'm just gonna uh, remind you that Kitchen said they have seven sandwiches left, so they will be uh, selling those at a good price to take home uh, a late lunch or dinner tonight, just to let you know that. Um, do you know the status of the uh, insurance of the Dr. Gosnell film, or the issuance of oh. the Dr. Gosnell film? Yeah, so there was a great, um, there's, been, there's been two or three great documentaries about Kermit Gosnell. The one, uh, the most recent one, I think it's called 1301 Lancaster, is that the right numbers? Uh, so it's a, it's a great documentary about Kermit Gosnell, an abortionist who um, was discovered to have been violating laws, um, to be just terrible abuse of um, preborn children, uh, actually taking the life of preborn children after they were born alive, and uh, actually having such a terrible clinic that um, several women were harmed. Uh, one woman actually passed away because he wasn't following accepted medical standards and uh, in his clinic. And so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard, obviously a hard documentary to watch. Uh, it doesn't hold anything back, um, but it shows uh, you know, the, the kind of story of Kermit Gosnell and some of the low safety standards around the country that the pro-life uh, movement is concerned about. Yeah, but what about the release of it? They're, they're having some difficulty getting it released, and they're thinking about financing the promoters. Okay, I'm not sure about that. So 1301 Lancaster, I know they've had a couple of hearing, I mean, a couple of screenings around the state. Um, unless you're thinking of a fourth the most recent one, the crowdfunded one that started about three years ago. Okay, we'll I'll have to I'll have to follow up about that. I might be speaking about the wrong one. What are your top uh, three most common pushbacks you get to your pro-life effort? So what what's what pushbacks yeah. from? Yeah, so so we have um, we have enough Republicans in both chambers that we should be able to pass anything um, without. You know, even though the Democrats oppose us. So, so we have enough Republicans in power that we should be able to pass all five of the bills that I put um, on your table. So, so the opposition I get is from Republicans. It's not from Democrats. It's not from individuals who claim to be pro-choice. It's actually from individuals who claim to be pro-life. And the pushback I get is, oh, these are hard votes. Oh, you know, we've been talking about abortion too much. You know, uh, oh, there are more important issues in the state like infrastructure, like school finance, uh, you know, water issues. Those are important issues. Good governance. That that's what you elect your your representatives and senators to do. However, 
in a building run by Republicans, there is enough time to make sure that we're protecting the most weak among us and making sure that we're at good governance of keeping the state run. Um, so, so I get those kind of more excuses. Um, not really arguments. They don't argue with us. They can't argue with us. They say they're pro-life. Very rarely is a Republican that will look you in the face and say, I just don't agree we should stop abortions. Uh, that there's only, that's only happened, uh, that only happens right now with one office. They're open about that. Most Republicans are like, yeah, I'm with you, but you know, what about the Supreme Court? Or yeah, I'm with you, but we've been talking about abortion a lot recently. Uh, let's, let's not, you know, let's not keep bringing this up. That's more of the kind of excuses that we hear in the Capitol. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to wrap it up with just a couple more things. Just a reminder, take your sheets. Uh, books are $10 or two for 15 sandwiches. And next time you come, it's at 11. So we don't want to um, do that. And then Biff's at the back for, with the box. Do you have the little lapel, the little feet lapel pins? I, uh, yes, I have a few in the car. Actually. Okay, I'll there you go. Them. Yes. All right. All right. Um, last question, and I was hoping we'd get around to this end of things, and I may need a little clarification, but is it simply economics and money that the egregious Texas law um, is hinged? Or, and let me give you the example. Um, staying on a ventilator for, with a terminal illness, who pays for it, um, and if it is not practical, not insured, and, un, um, and ultimately the hospital? Yeah, yeah, so, so talking so, about that law. Yeah, and, and also, to, if you'll follow up with, what do we, you know, what do we do to get the right paperwork in our file? Or, I mean, are we just up against a doctor being able, with loopholes, to come in and do what he's going to do anyway, or a hospital? Excellent. So in the Capitol, whenever we bring forth a reform to stop that process uh, that a hospital can use to turn off the ventilator, to remove the dialysis against your will, they say, whenever we're in the Capitol saying this shouldn't be done, they say it's never about finances. They say it's never about economics. They always say that it's about their personal ethics, is that we don't want to force these hospitals to violate their personal views uh, and of the patient. And so uh, that's their rhetoric. Um, and, you know, there's a, a obviously a refutation, a, a debate we can have about that. But they never say it's finances. Um, and so they kind of say this is something else. This is really a different principle. This is different philosophy. Um, what you can do, it is still prudent and it's still very important that you have a medical power of attorney, that you have the documentation that says who is the authority. If you're not able to make your own decisions, who is the legal authority to make decisions? Um, that is the most important thing that you can do. Uh, advanced directives are great that outline kind of your wishes uh, that's not as useful as a medical power of attorney who knows you well and knows the kind of things that you want and don't want. Uh, so that's the best thing you can do, and that gives you the best chance. If you do get into a conflict with the hospital, the hospital says you shouldn't have a certain treatment or is trying to force you into making a decision you or your loved one don't approve of, um, you, there are patient advocates in the state that can help you tread that, that can help you go through that process. Texas Rex Life is one of them. You can contact us. We have patient advocates around the state that come and help families communicate with the hospital and maybe even transfer to another facility that will listen to you. Um, and uh, we have those, and so that's kind of the most, the most important thing. But you still, it's still important to use medical power of attorney because most hospitals in the state uh, are going to first listen to, to the decisions you make. There are a couple of bad actors that give the rest a bad name. Uh, that are really imposing their values and their ethics on patients uh, and patients' families. And, uh, you know, but, but ultimately it's, it's definitely good to have those tools. Well, and I, I think that, I know for me, a lot of us think of right to life as the unborn and things. And when you yeah. swung into the, I mean, we just forget about the other end of our lives. Um, and so thankful that y'all are there for that. And I know John, our speakers are always so gracious to stay, stay afterwards for questions. So please feel free to take a few minutes with him before he heads back. And I think Rick's going to wrap us up. Thank you, John. I was telling you how much we appreciate it. Thank you so much.